Well, got to see me sometime during this video. Might as well be now. Revolvers. We've got revolvers here that are missing grips. We've got revolvers that are missing their grips and most of their guts. Most importantly, though, we have this revolver, which is an interim French revolver. Belongs to Ian McCollum, and it's in here to be completely conserved but not molested. But most importantly, though, is to have a set of grips put on it. These grips are so punked out on this thing that they're basically not even working anymore. The, uh, the checkering's gone on them. So I was provided with some material by the guys over at CN Arsenal, and they got me a book that showed me this gun. And out of this book, we're gonna go in and make a set of grips, copy this, conserve the inside of this thing, because I got a bad feeling what's gonna meet us when we get down, uh, down inside a rabbit hole, which is where I think we ought to be going. Let's, uh, let's make some grips and do a little bit of old fashioned revolver working. So we've identified, just remember that we have the book here. We've identified what this revolver is as a, I guess, and it's a transitional revolver between the Shamalo Delvin and what came after it. I'm, I'm not the history guy. You're going to have to wait for uh, Otheus to tell you about that. But just remember that we have this book. Um, let's see here. I'm going to try to get, I don't have that. There it is. Um, French military revolvers is what I'm guessing that is. Um, and I'm just showing this because I want to give the proper credit for this book. I'm showing where I've gotten this data from. This book's going to go away for a little while while we deal with the mechanicals on this thing. And then when it's time to checker the grips, we'll be back. Okay. I don't deal with many of these, but I'm told that if we undo that screw right there, that the side plate will come over. Oh, e gads, look at that. Oh, wow. So now we're down inside of an old revolver that either no one has cleaned or no one has cared about cleaning or I guess just values rust more than I do. I don't value it, so we're going to stop it from rusting, but we are not going to remove any pitting. We are not going to wire wheel this thing. We're not going to do anything crazy. This is actually a grip video. Um, and and I, I was going to do grips for it, but we're going to have to do the rest of the work while we're at it. So I'm just going to take a knife blade here and very gently massage this grip off. Okay. It's almost, this is a solid piece of wood, but it almost looks like it's been bleached or something. I don't know. It's white and it's punky and it's balsa wood and it's not... It's been worn down to the point where the wood is proud of the metal. Okay, so I can't really, I could just rechecker this, but the metal is a full, I'll show you how proud the metal is. Let me get this up in here in the world. You see that line of rust that's running down inside of here? Okay, those woods, that wood hasn't been touching here in a long time because it pretty much just rotted the wood out. So we're gonna have to replace this, it's hollow. So this represents some unique challenges from the grip standpoint. The other side of this, let's see here. I'm guessing that that screw is poking through somewhere. So that screw is probably behind the mainspring. So we got to dynamite the gun apart. So before I go any further, we're going to re-rig here, get up inside the universal work holding system and get a handle on this thing so I don't sense stuff flying across the room. I popped this spring out. There's a wedge-shaped part down here that fits down inside this hole. And I wasn't entirely positive how much force it was going to take to get this off. And um, I managed to get it out without damaging it. you got to be very careful that you don't drag the hooks out sideways. So anyway, we'll pop the spring free here. And then I'm going to bring this later on this way because I want to bring a little bit of contrast. There we go. Right there. And I'm going to get it without having to see the light. Okay. This is an interlock, I don't know, it's a hand timing bar. I haven't really gone through what makes this revolver tick. And I know you guys think I work on a lot of this stuff, but to be really honest, I don't take many of these apart and I'm, I'm going very, very slowly. And the video that you're watching is also my photographic record as to how the heck to put it back together again. And don't discount that. 
Um, I'm just, I want to make very, very sure that I don't create any more damage in here than I solve. All right, so that is going to lift out. This arm, I don't know, appears to retract and allow you to cycle the exercise the cylinder with the loading gate open. That should allow us to bring the hammer out, and it did. And there's a lot of muck here, but it doesn't look like it's been molested too hard. It really doesn't. The screw heads are tight. It almost looks like somebody hasn't been down inside this thing in a long time. Okay, can we bring the trigger out without having the cylinder off? Yep trigger's going to come out now. Oops, I lost the hand, dropped on the floor. Bruno got it, thank you. There's the hand, so we're starting to get a little pile of parts down there, and we're getting down inside of this revolver. We can see some pretty fancy, oh dear God, I don't want to have to make that spring. Jesus, look at that spring. That is epic. That goes in, comes around the corner, goes back up, and then there's a hole drilled in the center of it right there. Man, let me get the light on that. Look at that. Look at that thing. Yikes. Okay, so we got to respect that. A lot of energy there. We noted on inspection here, it's up the top. This firing pin is jammed in this hole, probably because it's been dry fired for a hundred and something years with no ammo. So we're going to have to fix that. We'll unplumb all of this. But why did we go on this archaeology expedition? I'll show you why. There's a screw right there. There's a screw right there, and if we are lucky, we will be allowed to extract that screw and liberate this grip off the other side without that escutcheon spinning. If all of this is locked up, that becomes a totally different story. We'll see here if we've got a bit that fits. Okay. We'll try this one. There we go. A lot of mung down in here. I think this white stuff I don't know, it feels like grease. It feels like some kind of powder. I don't know. But it has solidified. So I'm going to have to get my hand in front of you because I've got to buck this. And we might, I'm holding my finger back here and we're getting lucky. It's, uh, it might actually come out. We can use the, the screw to push a little bit. Okay, we'll get that screw out of here. We'll do this so that I don't need to use Bruno's hand. It just snuck in underneath it in an attempt to keep the screw from winding up on the other side of the shop. I don't know if you guys have ever done that, but you turn, I don't know, some little itty bitty screw loose and it drops six inches away from you. And it sounds like that over on the other side of the shop. I don't know how the hell it happens. All right, um, I've got this thing stripped the rest of the way down, almost all the way down. This screw right here, that is the retention screw for the thing that holds the side plate on. That's frozen solid, so that'll have to get broken loose. The firing pin, this thing right here, um, we'll, we'll give you a close-up shot of this firing pin. This thing's had to crap dry fired out of it, and it mushroomed the nose down and the retent the, the spring is is just smashed in here this thing is a real soup sandwich and the third thing i noticed was the barrel being screwed into the frame that's how this pivots this is the um ejector rod goes up through this sticks in through that hole the base pin for the cylinder comes oh god don't let that rust in now, I don't know if that's a feature, a feature being a defect that hasn't been correctly marketed. I don't know, but man, I could see carrying that in the field, getting your sweaty palms on that thing for a second, freezing that thing solid, and tying this whole gun up. That's an engineering issue right there that I don't know if it was addressed earlier or later. I don't know. Third thing, well, third thing would be fourth thing, actually. On this particular gun, here, let me get, there it is. This is the base pin for the lanyard loop. So this appears to drive in, snap over that, and, um, and, and allow this to fall out the bottom. But this is also keyed to the grips. So that, we have to leave a space for that. That rams up inside the grip right here. This is a complex little bugger, man. 
So a lot of people will ask, how come they're not making Garands anymore? What would it take to make a, a, a Sturm Gewehr 44? Well, the problem is, is when you're all tooled up, let's look at this grip right here. We're gonna make one of these by hand, but we have an inlet that has to be done all the way down in here to make room for the spring. There was a jig, they sat this thing on a jig, near it, and they cut it. And it was, it was basically a stock duplicator, and they were making 50 of these things a minute. And we gotta make one of them and it's gonna take a full shop day. And that is why your pet mill syrup isn't being made anymore because all of the tooling necessary to make it doesn't exist. And to make one of them by hand is prohibitive. Just ask Mr. Garand. While I got this camera jigged, this is active rust on the inside of this gun that I think has not been gone after because it still has patina. It has its, okay, well, we all know where I come down on the issue of patina. The problem is, all this is, is a really buffed down version of this. Once rust starts, once you oil it, it doesn't go away. So at the risk of possibly messing up someone's patina, I have to stop all of this, or this gun's gonna die. And there are certain critical things that are tied up now because it rusted. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to stop this active rust, brush off the, out the, uh, the oxide layer, and then leave it where it is. And it will still be wearing anything that it had that was original. Um, I'm not entirely positive that this gun wasn't in the white when it was new. That's also possible because the inside of it is white. Now when we're back, we've got the overhead camera rigged here. And you can see that we've now, we've conserved this rust down. We shot a little public service announcement in the interim, we had a visitor in the shop. So in the interim, we had all this boil and we got all of this hard red rust off of this. Let me see if it's any easier to see with that running. Whoa, boy, too much light. Oh, okay. So we got rid of this screw came out because when we conserved, it converted all the rust. We were able to pop that. Um, we've got this, we got a little bit of oil on this thing because that's still pretty scary. And we've taken care of all the other little things. We've still got a firing pin to make. We've got a couple of things, but the main reason why we're in here is to figure out how the heck we're gonna make a set of grips for this thing. This is the grip that goes on the back side. This goes back here, you can see the hole there where the, where the screw goes through. This is gonna be a fairly straightforward grip panel to make. It's pretty thin, um, it doesn't have any any weirdness to it and I figured something out this is the retention holder for the uh, for the sling swivel and that has to go right there that's a pretty straightforward inletting project because as you can see here it's just a rectangular cut right through here we just go through and make the cut and then inlet this bad boy down onto it like that so then as long as we're touching the bottom then this will come up in and that'll be fine. And then the part up on the top, it's just a matter of inletting. You can see this cut here. We'll just inlet that back. So this is actually the easy grip to make. The tough one is the one that goes on this side. This is gonna be the tough one. And you go, what's wrong with that grip? Why can't you remake it? I'm gonna tell you, you can't feel it, but it's a good eighth of an inch proud back here. It's, it's bad, it's bad. This wood is really, really punky. It has the consistency of balsa wood right here. It's done. So we're gonna make another one, but if you take a look at this, it's hollow. And I'd be willing to bet you there was a jig that this thing sat on and they moved the entire grip underneath a tool. And some lady sat in a factory during the middle of whenever the heck they were making this and probably made a hundred of these things a minute. We're gonna to have to reproduce that uh, one at a time. Again, you can see up against the background here that this is a rectangular cut that proceeds across the bottom. So this cut's made first, then we'll inlet this piece up onto it like that. Once that's done, this is just a, 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 where the um, lanyard goes, pushing through here, the bottom of the lanyard sticking through here and it goes on there. And then once we get all that done, we can just set this thing down in and we'll bring it off a little bit crooked like this and we'll just rotate it up until that gap disappears. 
bang. Once it's there, we've got it retained and then we'll inlet the, this slip here where the side plate goes down and traps it. And we'll leave all this wood proud out here. And once we got it all down, all settled in and screwed down hard, we can come up and mark underneath the backside here and here, cut the outline, file to shape, and then figure out the checkering pattern. The checkering is actually the easiest, is the easiest part of this thing. Now, when you're making a brand new gun, you get the metal to the right dimensions for it to operate. And then you get all the inletting done because you're going to mark it up and then you finish the metal. In this particular case, we do not have the luxury of putting a mark on this bad boy. So we're going to have to be very, very careful how we do our inletting. I would think now we should look at a selection of woods and figure out what we want to make this look like. So here's the old grip and it's, um, it's dry rotted. This is all dry rot. It's all punky. So I took the, a piece of wood here and I transferred the outline onto it and just to get close, just to get, you know, somewhere in the zone. And then what we'll do here is put a little bit of, um, inlet compound so we'll get this on my brush here and I'm going to run the inlet compound right here because what we're going to try to do is pick this inner curve up now this inner curve is slanted away at an angle like that it runs around so what you got to watch is that you don't put it up here and tip it in it's got to come straight down into it like this and we're going to get that tight on the bottom, tight right there, and tap that down. And then we get this black line on the back of it. And what we'll do is we'll cut this black line at that reverse curvature angle. It's a pretty steep angle, and it tips out that way. So we'll just file this until that black line disappears, and that should sit there. This is the back side of the edge that actually touched the frame right here. So that's what we want to develop and we have to go from one dimension to another at a fairly steep angle. Okay, so that has removed all of that black line. And uh, let's go try it back out on a frame here. So let's look at that. Okay, we got a little bit of rub there that was probably me just messing around with it. So we're going to ignore that. But that's an actual indicate right there. So we'll come back up and file a little bit more of that off. I'm leaving these grips thick because I want to have some extra space. I want to be able to hang on to this thing. When we're all done, this grip is so thin you can't even hang on to it. there this is just rough shaping all I'm doing is just knocking just knocking walnut down off the outside
So now I've got it down to a thickness that's pretty close to how thick this has to be. I gotta knock just a tad more off to get that level and we'll be in there. Just a little bit off of this side right here. There we go. All right. It's the right thickness. It's about the right width. That's perfect. So we'll go ahead and make this uh, make this inlet now. I'll get asked why not a curved chisel I could use one it's not gonna matter this isn't even gonna be the line when I cut to the line I'll go back and get a curved one Important point to note here is, is while we're doing all this woodwork, the gun and two others like it are in the back conserving. You can only can never just do one thing at a time in this gig. You gotta have multiple items going on at once. No, it's not that precise, but I'm just marking stuff out. So I uh I can see kind of where I am. Again, the exact curvature of this doesn't matter. The exact curve of this inlet that I'm cutting out doesn't matter because this whole thing's gonna go in that way. It's all gonna go in by the thickness of this lump of metal right here. So we still gotta come down a little bit. So that's gonna necessitate standing it up on end here. I'll show you where we're at so far. And uh, I gotta take another angle at this. So I've got the original grip next to this grip. And I'm rolling this around and showing you guys what it takes to inlet that. Now I'll tell you, this was set up to be inletted on a machine. And I'm attempting to replicate by hand what was done with the machine and just, it probably just came in and cut it. Um, because it's multiple angles. Now, when I was filming the um, overhead, it's, it's come to my... Um, attention that I lost that overhead camera and you'll see me looking up but this is the line I was talking about let me pull the light behind it right there so you can see the semicircle and you can see where it you can actually see a little bit there where it dug into the frame which is exactly what I want we'll remove all this garbage off the top once we know where it is so at the end of the day this clip goes in right there and we had to um in inlet that in three dimensions right there and that had to settle down it's got to go just a skosh further however it's it's basically there um, off to the other side here we are now I've got this piece of wood clamped to the stock now you can see along the bottom of this I have no air because I have this at exactly 90 degree angles and shoved all the way into the bottom we put the hinged side plate on and brought it over and you can see where it's touching the front. It doesn't even come down below. Second angle, a little bit more of this, and then uh, the third angle, 
I scribed a line around the front. Now that side plate doesn't come down flush yet. So that line is a total lie and that line's gonna move, but that's telling me kind of where the front of the grip's gonna be. That's just a, hey Mark, don't take the chisel behind it here. Okay, with the inlet black, I bring the cover back around and give it a good crack. And you can see up at the top, you can see some black um, where that marked and that needs to be cut off. So this is just a continuous, you uh, shut the cover, give it a crack, bring it back out and remove only the black. There's a temptation here to want to remove a lot more material than that. Don't succumb to that temptation. You will have to do it over again. The black leaves an inlet line. You can see it about halfway between the circular part of the outside of the grip and the inside. And then I've also put the other grip, the old grip, up against this so that I'm keeping an eyeball on where I'm going. Thank God we got the old grips because without them, you're just guessing. So you keep blacking this thing in and, and this side panel will come further and further and further around the corner. But as you can see in the upper left, the trigger pin hasn't even started emerging through the hole yet. You'll see the trigger pin show up as we get further around the corner. The same shot, different corner. You can see now the gap between the two sides of the frame is beginning to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, I don't want to take that gap all the way down to zero. I want that screw when it runs in from the other side into the big threaded hole right in the center. I want that to put a little bit of clamping force on this grip so it doesn't swim around like the current one does. Almost down. You can start seeing that pin emerge through. Um, there's three holes there, the center one of the holes. You can actually see the pin starting to emerge. I'm almost down. At this point, I'm going to have to start removing some wood from that arc because it becomes a little bit cumbersome to, to try to inlet the, the curve as you're coming all the way in from the top. As you're getting near the end of this, you can see that black line is going almost all the way around. What I want to have when this thing touches all the way down is basically everything to the left side of that black line. I want it to be black. I want about 80% contact. Um, and that wooden tab right there is what holds the grip on. So we want to make all that be tight. Um, we've got a little bit more to relieve up on the right hand side where you can see where the black, um, where the black smudge is. Um, there's, it's got to get cleaned up. Trust me, it'll get cleaned up. Almost have full light. You can see now that this is beginning to get a lot smoother as I'm cleaning it out and paring off all of the excess wood. We're getting rid of all of the chisel marks. You can see I've started to round, that, uh, round the radius over a little bit so I can get down into the bottom of the hole. So in this shot now, you can see where I've removed a lot of the wood from the top of the grip and that the frame is almost closed. So the pinhole that the hammer rides on is now full of pin. Um, so we're getting close here. Another shot of the same deal, uh, in tighter now, I've taken a rounded chisel and actually removed a lot of the material up at the top of the grip, just so that I know where the line is. I don't want to get false indications. I want that metal to come right up to the wood and look like the tree grew up against the side of it. That's what I'm heading for. So I'm all the way down. You can see this black line runs all the way around and it touches at the front, the middle, and in the back, when this whole thing is closed up now, there's just a little bit of force holding it all in and the wood compresses ever so slightly. It's just this, the lapse time on this is probably four hours because I kept getting interrupted in the shop. I was alone and I've already realized that allowing Mark to run the video gear is a mistake. So up until this time, we've been working in plan and profile here and we're in the square. So now we got to come out of square and we got to go ahead and cut this and knock it back to where we can go ahead and work on it. Um, those of you that are looking at this particular camera angle right here, this one, this camera is around backwards. So the bench, it's almost as if you're standing up on top of the bench uh, with your rear end towards the, the, the wall looking down on it. Kind of weird, but it's going to show this because I'm right-handed and I have to attack this problem with tools from a different direction. So just bear with me and it will be worth it. Uh, the original grips are awfully small here, but this is just a rounded off face. So we're just going to round that off back to about here or so. And then we have to roll out around this corner 
this sharp edge right here, that has to be one continuous unbroken line all the way down to the bottom. It cannot have any discontinuities or any um, uh, herky jerks in it. Same thing up here. So we're gonna knock the backs off, knock the front off, and I'm just gonna go ahead and shape this. Be careful when you're doing this that you don't come all the way to the edge with the chisel because when you get right here, it'll blow this piece of wood off all the way down to the bottom. So that's why I'm coming front and back with the chisel. You hear that little snap? That little snap when I was doing that, little snick right there. Let me let me get it up close so you can hear it. That little snap right there is the wood breaking off. So you gotta make sure you don't let the wood break off. This whole thing is like rubbing a cat's fur. It's got fur sticking up. And whichever way the grain runs out, so you wanna be cutting this way, not that way. You try to cut this way and it'll snap off, but if you cut this way, it'll just cleave it off the top. So then also, the grain's running this way. So when I'm back here and I'm cutting like this, it's snapping off, but when I'm up here and cutting, it's cutting into the direction. So you just have to continuously pay attention to that. So I'm trying to find the bottom, and I'm pretty close to the bottom right here where I'm actually going to be touching the metal. I don't want to come all the way in because I want to have the, the luxury of knocking this off in this plane right here with a piece of sandpaper. However, I do want to find where this rolls out right here because I want to know where that is, I want to know where that is, and then I know what the clean line looks like. We'll put the clean line on the top and then fade it towards the metal, but we can't touch the metal on this thing. So it's really, really weird to back fit wood on the metal when it's usually done the other way. So let's just go ahead and knock a little bit more of this off so we can see what's going on here. There's also a rebate. There's a rebate to this metal where the metal actually goes, the metal has a bevel to it. So we're kind of dropping into that bevel also, but we'll take care of that with sandpaper right down near the end. Okay. Yeah. You hear that clicking? That's the wood objecting to what's going on here. Now some of this, my body position's a little funky because I'm trying to let you guys see what I'm doing. Ordinarily, I would be standing right here like this and you wouldn't be able to see squat. My head would be banging in and all you're looking at is my back. That's not very entertaining, so I'm gonna get back out of the way here. see I've gotten that line is developing a little bit of a bump here okay right there Just 
you gotta remember at this point you've got eight maybe nine hours in the project so we're getting to the point now where one oopsie daisy starts getting expensive from the time standpoint And again, we're working in plan and profile. Even though I'm kicking this in a little bit that way, I'm still basically getting this outline down to where it needs to be, get it down there, and then I'll look at it this way and I'll grab it that way. And then at the very end, we'll come in with a rasp and just kind of clean it up a little bit. Now, ordinarily, I wouldn't use a rasp on, on wood, except that most of this grip is gonna be covered with diamonds. So let's check off into that here for a second and take a look at something. We got lucky and there's a little bit of the checkering pattern still on this piece of wood right here. So we can divine a couple of things from this and the photograph out of the book. The photograph out of the book is gonna tell us how far down the pattern comes down this edge here. And then we know that there was a line across here that kind of bumped up over the top of this and we've got that. So let's refer to that picture from the book here. There's a, a border around the outside of this and we can see actually the tops of the diamonds. So these were cut down and then the tops were sanded off. That makes sense. We know that the diamonds go through the escutcheon. So when we're checkering it, we have to make sure that we don't have this escutcheon in place or else we'll bump it with the tool and the diamonds won't be full depth up against it. This isn't gonna be that bad. We can also see here where the grip is rounded off on a top up there. So this is what we're copying from a photograph, except we don't have to scale this picture because we have the luxury of knowing that there's 16 diamonds for a 14 per inch and that the um, and what the spacing is and what the aspect ratio is. So we don't have to scale off of this drawing. We are, however, fortunate that we have this book and that we have that to go by and you've got to grasp at everything you can grasp at while you've got it. So I'm developing this edge here and I've started using a rasp and I'm pulling this edge along. But as you see, you hold the rasp at a constant angle and it allows this curve to just sweep right off of here and sweep down. Same thing on the other side, you can see the line developing there. I know I've got the, the uh, light in the way here, but you can see that line and you cut to that line. Don't just start rolling it over right away. The other thing that's working is, is that my fingers are a little bit dirty because they have the inletting marker on them and you can actually rub that down and you can really see where the line goes so that's all we're doing we're trying to not touch this we haven't touched the frame and we haven't touched anything else along the way so now it's just a matter of how low can you go
So we're looking at the book. Here's the old grip. Old grip. And there's the photograph of what we were trying to copy. So I did a little bit of light staining and there it is. And honestly, I think we might have got pretty damn close here to uh, getting it right. Now you would say, well, I didn't get the stain color right. There's a little bit of red in it, but I'll tell you this, who printed this book? Um, what color palette did they use? We don't know. So the, I, I don't know what French formula stains were. I'm not trying to be accurate here. I'm just trying to get this thing looking good from, you know, five, 10 feet away. And personally, I think we may have succeeded in that. It sure feels a lot better. Um, I'm going to get out of this video now. The, the gun's been conserved and the other grip is the other grip and that's going to be a couple hours of hell. And before I'm all done, I want you guys to understand that this is about $600 worth of work I did to this revolver. I don't do this for 40 or 50 bucks a pop. There's a lot of work that goes into one of these to even have a prayer of having it look decent. But I'll tell you what, um, I hope Ian's happy with this thing. I don't have the ammo to test fire it anyway. Um, it's, it's not 32 French long. I know what y'all are thinking. It's eight millimeter French ordnance. However, comma, and still asking for some. So if you got any 32 French long, pipe up. As always, a pleasure to be of service.